As the climate emergency escalates, the world is getting scarier and scarier. But your home can be your sanctuary. And your home can help to stop the world descending into dystopia. And your home can show you that climate action doesn't have to feel like sacrifice. It can actually improve your life. Imagine your home costs little or nothing to heat, or even nothing. And imagine that at the same time, it always felt fresh and comfortable, come hail, rain or shine. And imagine that it was future-proofed to withstand the extreme temperatures that an increasingly uncertain world throws at it. What you're imagining is a passive house, and it's a real thing. In essence, it's an evidence-based standard which involves making buildings so energy efficient that you may never need to turn the heating on. But before I tell you how it's done, I want to show you what the effect is. The most consistent feedback you hear from people living in passive houses is the constant comfort. It's the feeling of not cursing at the cold when you have to get out of bed on a winter morning. It's not knowing whether you're properly dressed for the weather until you're at the door. It's the serenity and quiet, not hearing noises from outside unless you choose to open a window. In most passive houses, the designer will specify a small heating system just in case. But in this sheltered housing scheme in the south of England, the architect opted not to, instead only adding little battery heaters to the ventilation system. This was a remarkable decision, especially given the scheme was designed for elderly people who tend to need higher temperatures. But five years after the elderly residents moved in, in nine of the 18 units, they still hadn't turned the heaters on. Sometimes the lack of a heating system happens by chance rather than design. When the boiler broke down in Larch House in Wales before Christmas 2013, the tenants barely blinked, asking the plumber who came around to fix the boiler to come back after Christmas. And then nature gets in the way. Andrew Mitchler's passive house in Colorado is off-grid. It's self-sufficient for all energy, with only a fairly modest solar array for electricity. Andrew's been renting the house out during the pandemic, and when multidisciplinary artists Jeffrey Austin and E.J. Hill stayed there for three weeks in February to record an album, a record-breaking cold front came down from the Arctic, the same one that hit Texas a week later. For four days, the temperatures outside the house were colder than a gravedigger's shovel, between minus 28 and minus 33 degrees Celsius, or minus 10 to minus 19 Fahrenheit to our non-metric friends. Andrew's design for the house included a hot water cylinder to boost the air temperature of the ventilation system if needed. But the water pipes froze, so the water couldn't get into the house, meaning no heating. Yet the temperatures inside the house never drop below 14 and a half degrees Celsius or 48 Fahrenheit. Not exactly toasty, but extraordinary in such extreme conditions. Stephen Tierney's passive house in Dublin exhibits a different kind of resilience. Resilience against unsanctioned fun. Stephen went to Spain on holiday the summer after moving in, leaving his teenage son to look after the house. And Stephen's house happens to feature some additional bells and whistles in the form of an online dashboard for his ventilation system. And here's what he spotted. In a passive house, the indoor air quality and temperature graphs will tend to look a lot like a flatlining electrocardiogram machine because the levels stay within such a tightly controlled range. But when Stephen logged in from Spain, he noticed the CO2 levels spiking, catching his son red-handed having a party. But it's not all rainbows, lollipops, and covert surveillance. When we interviewed Ross Kremen about his passive house in the Irish Midlands, he pointed out some drawbacks. His family have a hard time staying in other people's homes because they've become accustomed to such high comfort levels. 
And then there's Christmas. In Ireland, it's traditional to have an obscenely large turkey for Christmas dinner. The carcass is then stored in a cold room for a second Christmas dinner the next day before being gnawed at till some stage in January. Ross's passive house had no cold room. He had to keep the turkey in the car. <laughs> Ross also says it can be disarming that when visitors arrive, the first you hear of it is when the doorbell rings because of the house's acoustic performance. And that's also the case at Michael Bennett's low-cost passive house scheme in Wexford, which is built out of timber frame and recycled newspaper insulation. In Ireland, homes in multi-unit schemes are subject to acoustic tests to measure noise transfer across party walls. The seasoned tester on these homes, Ted Dalton, said he'd never seen a result like it. The score of 69 decibels was akin to the kind of sound insulation level that he would attempt to design into walls between commercial cinemas. And what's more, they were cheap to build. A University of Ulster study found the cost uplift to be the princely sum of 0.01% compared to minimum compliance with building regulations. And new research indicates that the benefits of Passive House may go far beyond energy, comfort, acoustics, and economics. Over 226,000 lung cancer deaths per year globally are estimated to be caused by radon in residential buildings. Radon, an odorless, invisible, radioactive gas that occurs naturally in the ground, tends to reach higher levels when it's warm inside and cold outside. It's a particular problem in the southwest of Ireland, including Tralee. The World Health Organization recommends taking remedial action at 100 becquerels per cubic meter. One house near this venue posted 500 times that score, 50,000 becquerels per cubic meter. Three of the occupants died of lung cancer. An Irish study on radon in passive houses found average levels of 36 becquerels per cubic meter, compared to an average for Irish buildings generally of 89. And what's more, the real difference may have been greater still because the study included a disproportionate number of passive houses in high radon areas. So we know passive house works, but how relevant is it in the context of climate change? I don't need to talk about climate change and the fact that extreme weather events are becoming increasingly frequent and severe. The evidence for that is incontrovertible. But we must understand the new and sometimes surprising demands that climate change is already placing on our buildings. Flooding, extreme heat, increased wind-driven rain, and counterintuitively, cold snaps. New research indicates that climate change may be causing the Gulf Stream to collapse and that this may cause considerably colder winters in some areas. Ireland and the United Kingdom have the same latitude as Labrador in Canada. Without the Gulf Stream, would we have the same climate? So we're faced with a problem. It's not a question of whether our actions can stop climate change. It's about trying to give our families, our grandchildren, our children, even ourselves, the best chance of survival in an increasingly uncertain world. And for that to happen, we have to do two things. We have to limit the extent of change by radically and urgently cutting emissions. We have to adapt so that we can give us, become resilient enough to withstand the change that's already locked in. Doing one thing or the other is not good enough. We must do both. We can help achieve these goals in our homes by making them passive houses. And this would be a great idea, even if there was no climate emergency. As indoor air quality expert Dr. Richard Corsi points out, in the West, we spend more time in our buildings than most whale species spend underwater, about 90% of our time. And recently, we've been spending more time at home. The winter after COVID hit, daytime heating energy use in Europe increased by over 14% compared to the previous winter, 
even though it was 0.6 degrees Celsius milder. And COVID's making us think more about ventilation too, and indoor air quality more generally. But here's the tricky part. How do you ventilate a building in winter without making it so cold that people block vents and turn off fans, or stick to their guns and jack up the heating to compensate? The passive house standard is the answer, because it's designed to ensure comfort, good indoor air quality, and low energy use. And here are the key elements to building one. High levels of insulation to external walls, roofs, and ground floors. Triple glazed windows to stop heat escaping and to let in the optimal amount of passive solar heat from the sun during the heating season. Too much passive solar gain can be a real problem, and it's one the passive house standard takes care to avoid. Passive houses and passive solar houses should not be confused. Continuity of insulation to prevent heat loss at junctions and penetrations via a process known as thermal bridging, and to keep internal surfaces warm and dry. Air tightness to stop heat leaking out of gaps, and to stop vapor condensing on building fabric and causing structural damage. And because we need a constant supply of fresh air without creating discomfort or high energy use, a ventilation system which recovers heat from stale outbound air and passes it onto incoming fresh air, which is then filtered before entering the house. It's an important feature when outdoor air quality is an issue. The first passive house, a four-unit terrace in Darmstadt in Germany, was built in 1991. Since then, tens of thousands of buildings have been built to the standard all around the world. Many have been subject to detailed monitoring, and the evidence is clear. They work. 25 years after it was built, the first passive house was put through the ringer and subjected to an invasive monitoring study. External insulation was cut off the walls. Heat loss from the custom-built triple-glazed windows was measured. Air quality in the ventilation ducts, which had never been cleaned, was sampled. All were found to be effectively as good as new and predicted to last at least another 25 years. The house has performed with monotonously excellent energy use ever since being built, and importantly in a world where climate extremes mean that extreme temperatures are going to place new demands on our buildings, it's avoided overheating during hot spells too, all without air conditioning. But let's indulge ourselves and judge a book by its cover. Do passive houses have a particular look? Will they restrict architectural freedom? No and no. While it's true that the standard is much simpler to meet with simple forms, with good design, it's a remarkably flexible standard, whether it's a cutting-edge piece of ingenious modern design on a seemingly unbuildable site, or a remarkable retrofit, in this case done without any petrochemical products, to a listed period building. Is it just for houses? That would be a no again. The standard can be applied to any kind of building, and it's becoming increasingly common where the client recognizes the need to take action on the environment while ensuring a good indoor environment. The first passive house hospital is nearing completion in Frankfurt. Passive house schools are becoming increasingly common, reflecting the recognition that comfortable, healthy buildings create good learning environments. Sometimes, passive houses are built to create good indoor environments for inanimate objects rather than people, such as this Imperial War Museum archive building near Cambridge. Passive house can help preserve precious artifacts for future generations and protect future generations too. So where to now? Passive house isn't the answer to every environmental problem, even in the case of buildings. We still need to build them in the right locations, to avoid building larger than we need, and to ensure that we build using materials that minimize environmental impacts. And we need to apply the principles of Passive House to our existing buildings, wherever possible. But Passive House also points to an important general principle. Curiously, one of the main ways we stand to make progress on climate 
is by mimicking the past. Up till the 20th century, our homes were simple. We relied on open fires to keep warm, with insulation in the form of extra clothing. Then the oil age came, and we started introducing central heating. A couple of oil crises later, and with understanding of climate change materializing, we experimented with adding insulation while looking for high-tech solutions to reduce energy use and cut emissions. But it turns out the solutions we need for the 21st century look a lot like the 19th century options, except with the insulation on the building, not the person, and the open fire consigned to the past. Passive House offers us an important opportunity to turn the conventional wisdom on climate action on its head. Being green doesn't necessarily have to mean sacrifice. You could have no concern about climate change and the conditions our grandchildren, our children, and even we ourselves will have to endure in the coming years. But you could still appreciate the superior standard of living that Passive House gives you. Passive House, therefore, is one form of radical climate action that everybody can agree to, irrespective of how much import they associate with climate action. We can find common ground by focusing, where possible, on climate solutions that everybody can agree to. And frankly, given the challenges facing humanity this century, this is exactly the kind of common ground we need. Thank you.